we all are slaking for purpose. And so the thing that makes you undeniably happy, like if you're not trying to advocate and champion to that to the utmost degree, you're probably not living the most fulfilling life that you can be living. Like if you're not doing the exact thing that you want to be doing, you should start doing it yesterday. <laughs> Hey everybody, you may have noticed that we've occasionally produced these shorter episodes in which rather than recap and do a deep dive into some literary work or film, we instead spin off a conversation related to one of those deep dives. And Chris and I decided we want to do more of these digression episodes, largely because it's a good way for us to get more guests onto Upper Middle Brow. So you may notice a few more of these digressions in the midst of Upper Middle Brow proper episodes. And we've also decided that since scheduling Chris and me and a guest can be really hard, sometimes it may just be one of us with the guest, like today. So for this digression, I am joined by Joshua Moore. He is a writer and an editor. He's the author of the memoirs Model Citizen and Sirens, as well as five novels, including Damascus, which the New York Times called, quote, Beat Poet Cool. He's also the founder of Decant Editorial. Josh was introduced to us by our podcast pal Leah Jones of Finding Favorites. And he has a reaction he's going to share to the idea of the hapless protagonist, which is a theme we've talked about in some of our past episodes, including Jonathan Lethem's The Arrest. And we're going to talk a lot about his most recent novel, Farsickness, published by House of Vlad. It's the story of Hal Dalloway, who is a veteran with repressed memories of his service. Hal hears a voice in his head that calls him to a quote, castle in Scotland. So he gets on a plane, heads there, and the castle turns out to be a double-wide trailer, which is sort of an office, with a girl inside who is waiting for him. And immediately it gets rather surreal, and we suspect that Hal is actually journeying into his own psyche. So let's just get right into my conversation with Joshua Moore. We, uh, I, I was like about 15 years ago, I was in a band and we were in Charlottesville, just me and my friends, but we decided we were going to do a tour and we went up to Bar Harbor around this time of year and we ended up, somebody just booked us into like, it wasn't a venue, it was like a bar and, and they were expecting us, you know how they have like cover bands at bars they were not really we weren't really a cover band we were kind of more like an indie band but they um they were expecting us to entertain everybody for three hours and we had about 10 songs so we did our set like oh. twice and the second time fortunately people were drinking enough that they couldn't tell the difference <laughs> and uh the second time through I, there's actually some photos of people like kind of dancing on the floor so i think we won them over but uh that it was... is funny too when like an original act gets yeah. in front of a room and they're like, "We thought you were just going to play Boston covers." Like, right? What, exactly. What are you yeah. talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there's almost like there's two different music scenes. There's the sort of like yeah, yeah, totally. and play covers, and there's the original songs. And I mean, they were you know we were, we made it work. There was a lot of goodwill to go around. You can always tell and... the difference too because the venue has original songs, only has like twelve people in, right. in it, right? <laughs> Right. Well, but those people are listening. And then the ones with the cover bands, they're just they're there to eat their like, you know, hamburgers and, yeah. uh, you know, they yeah, just human karaoke machine. For exactly. Sure. Exactly. Um, I got your book um, and I was able to read like the first five or six chapters. And I'm curious where you first got the idea of having a character experiencing. Actually, am I saying it right? Fernware? Or Fernway. I mean, Fernway. I'm probably saying it wrong too. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, or the translation is far sickness. Where did that, where did that, or how did that idea first occur to you? I think it was kind of on three main tributaries that kind of brought me to wanting to write about Fernois. Uh, first being uh, the COVID lockdown. Uh, where just, I think like most of us, as we're kind of 
forced into this incarceration, just found myself slaking for escapism. Hmm. You know, like looking at the little star stickers on my daughter's ceiling being like, I want to go to there. I don't even know where there is. I just yeah. fucking don't want to be here anymore. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, led me to kind of once I start to st- k- kick a concept around, suddenly once you like open your heart and open your ears, you start to see all these various influences. And then all of a sudden, no, I was chewing on that. I still hadn't, I didn't know what Fernois was yet. Right. I was just uh, looking for escapism and I rewatched Guillermo del Toro's wonderful masterpiece, uh, Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah. Right. Which is ostensibly about the, the Spanish Civil War. Right. But half of it is set in the imagination of a child. Uh, and what she's dealing with in her real status quo is so, so terrifying that she's cooked up this this alternative place to spend some time. Kind of this sanctuary ecosystem that's populated by all sorts of horror tropes which is a very Guillermo del Toro thing to do I still don't know about far sickness yet hmm. Hmm. then all of a sudden what happened is we had a nine-year-old or an eight-year-old when lockdown started and you know we potted up like other families did and my wife and I built a theater edifice in our front yard uh, and we decided to write these little scripts to uh let the neighborhood kids do these little productions. So we started to write these little one act plays and these little eight or nine year old girls, our little theater troupe uh, would perform it. Right. And, you know, over the first few, not even their goddamn parents wanted to come. Right. But (laughs) three or four months into this, whole fucking neighborhood was showing up man yeah like even the weird widow down the street showed up with a plate of peanut butter cookies for everybody and i watched art activate this mechanism of escapism you know and not just in an insular way we were doing it together like this idea about like a, a, a petrified but a catharsis nonetheless right and so i watched these girls take apart and put back together everybody and like it made such a stunning impression on me you're saying that the the theater was like healing to the neighbors oh and friends absolutely and who showed up that, and what was cool i remember the the exact show that they were doing on the day that this all dawned on me is they they were all wearing these makeshift astronaut helmets and they were all their mission was they were going to go to the moon to sing a song with david bowie oh. right and we were all crying, man. Just yeah. watching these girls do this unbelievable thing. But we all wanted to believe. We were so scared that all we wanted to do was watch these beautiful children sing on the moon with David Bowie. Wow. Wow. And, you know, your narrator's guide into this world that he's being called to explore is a child with a horrific wound you got it and you know we know that he's a he was a sniper this as far as i've gotten i'm i'm and i don't want to do spoilers but i'm about a third of the way through right so like i and i know that he has something like ptsd and he has memories that are missing to him and you know so one begins to suspect as a reader that there's a relationship between his past and who this particular girl is and when you went in to write this, did you know where it was going? Where you know, did you know like, okay, he's going to meet the girl in the second chapter? Then you know, in chapter four, we're going to have the man, the blood sucking man bat, and the moat keeper, et cetera. <laughs> did you have that planned out and plotted out like on an outline, or did you kind of sit down to write and see what emerged? One one quick thing before we get to the actual construction of the book right oh yeah so yep i watched the the girls with david bowie mm-hmm. uh, and i come back into my office and in sharpie across the wall i wrote the phrase demanded whimsy mm. and i just sort of stood there and looked at it for me i didn't know what it meant yet right but i know that i wanted to do something that the girls had just did did you say dement i sort of broke for demented demented, demented whimsy mm. yeah Uh, And so that was the last alchemical piece that I Mm -hmm. needed to put together. Mm -hmm. And that's when I stumbled upon the word for I'd never heard the word before. Uh, A guy told me about this concept of far sickness, being homesick for a place that you've never been. 
And suddenly it felt like that was exactly what all of us were sick with in one way or another during lockdown. You know, how do we quench this this appetite to go someplace that's just not as scary as the place that we're forced to live in right now? Now, to answer your question, I don't write with a plan because I love the reckless and wanton uh, process of discovery. Like we're both old musicians, right? And like I played in bands since I was a junior high schooler, right? So it was just like, yeah. I love that thing about just having a germ, right? Having a conceit and just giving yourself that creative latitude to just feel fucking free and explore. And I write in the same way. I knew what the opening image was gonna be. I knew that I wanted to get somebody who was hearing a voice in his head, calling him home to a place that he's never been before. I knew that I wanted to write it in such a way where half the people reading it are going to think that, yeah, this crazy cat hopped on an airplane and went to Scotland. And half that readers are going to be like, this guy didn't go anywhere. You know, mm -hmm. the entire story is taking place right in the haunted house that is his skull. <laughs> Uh, so you're as you're as you were talking about, like it's a very surreally plotted story, right? We have a guy who goes to Scotland into an empty field, and there's a double wide trailer, and he goes through a secret door into this sort of underground realm. Um, so we're you know riffing on you know bipolar, or Alice in Wonderland, or however you want to kind of think about this this idea of through the looking glass. What's exciting about it for me is that like I don't tell you the why for until the back half of the book, right? So in a weird way, as a storyteller, it's really about what what questions you're trying to empower in your audience. And I want you to be saying, who's this girl with the bullet hole in her face? Who's this lady named the lacerated queen who needs to eat a grenade every couple hours so her head explodes? So I, I'm I'm hopefully if I've done my job right. I'm plumping these questions up and that's sort of creating this undeniable appetite. So the reader wants to race to the end of the book to, to figure out like, how do I put all these pieces together? I'm having fun, but what the fuck does all this mean? <laughs> right, right. And that's totally the effect so far. And, and so when you first write The Lacerated Queen, do you know what mm -hmm. she means to the character? Nope. No, in fact, I wrote the I'm a big advocate of constantly taking stock of the props you have in your character's vicinity, not through your eyeballs as the auteur, but for the character's eyeballs. Hmm. And when I looked at the scene, when I was first writing the scene with when she's when we're meeting Dill, the 11 year old, she was just sitting at a completely clean desk and she was talking to Hal. And I thought to myself, like, there needs to be a dissonant note in this scene. There's something, mm. there's not, there's nothing supplying any sort of danger here, mm. uh, literal or metaphorical, right? And then all of a sudden I decided to put her, a grenade on her desk. I was like, well, that's interesting. I don't know what the hell it means yet, but what can I do? What can I extract out of that to make the drama escalate as we get deeper into it, right? So then the Lacerated Queen's character simply grew out of putting that prop on the table. Right. So I'm constantly taking a stock of what exists in the present tense and then trying to like superimpose opportunities that then might present themselves in, you know, scenes and chapters yet to be generated. What I like about it so far, I love the um, I love the ambiguity that we're talking about. Uh, I was, you know, at some point, actually, I think this came up in our discussion of the arrest. I, I know that I've talked about how, one of the things I like about The Shining, the film is that you can interpret almost everything that happens in that film as being generated by the character's imagination. Sure. You know, yep. that the supernatural elements, with maybe one exception, never physically manifest. You know, all the only influence they appear to have is to get Jack and maybe the other characters to do terrible things or to do violent things. But they, you know, the ghosts, if they exist, don't actually do anything uh, other than communicate and terrify uh, the characters. And so I, I love the idea of that movie is you can interpret that movie as being about ghosts that inhabit this hotel or it could be about a man with his own internal demons, you know, confronting yeah. them. And, you know, I think that movie is an, an allegory for alcoholism, you know, which is particularly oh, if you know, sure if you know 
Yeah. Right. You know, and all of that anger. And I, I think your book has that same quality where the Fernway, the Fernwa voice, it could be an external voice or it could be something in Hal Dalloway that is calling him towards this journey of recovery and healing that he has to go through. And, you know, up to this point, like I'm very much along for the ride and you've, you know, you've whetted my curiosity. Like I want yeah. to figure out what else he needs to figure out. And I guess maybe one more question about it is I'm curious why you chose to ha- for him to be a, a veteran, a veteran of Afghanistan, right? Well, I think the couple different facets of it. The first one was uh, I feel like I feel like I'm on crazy pills since covid because we don't Mm. talk about it yeah you know like we all went through this maybe low grade maybe high grade depending on like the idiosyncrasies of your particular family and friend system of experience during that time yeah we've all gone through some some horror some atrocity and i want to talk about that ptsd like in a weird way we're living through this new version of the roaring 20s right when everybody's just sort of like La, la 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 and it and it's it's driving me i wasn't very sane before i went into life right and now <laughs> yeah, like yeah, i'm yeah. looking around and everybody let's not talk about the war let's not talk <laughs> about the pandemic let's pour some yes. martinis and yeah you know dance with some flappers and turn up the jazz for yeah. sure thousand yeah. percent and we this feels like we're having this sort of you know postmodern roaring 20s and i wanted to use uh you know, somebody who we would say is one of our biggest uh, populations who we have systematically and fundamentally failed as a country, yeah. as our returning yeah. veterans are like, you know, thank you for your service. You know, like, here's a prescription and a job as a Walmart reader, like do and do your fucking best. Uh, and so it felt like that would be a nice way to start this conversation. Uh, about you know us all having in one way or another this this PTSD that the only way that we're going to get over it is to face it, right? So the the monster that that Hal is really putting off is you know having these conversations with the man in the mirror. Uh, also having him clear caves gives me you know this this kind of dominant light motif of mm. being being in an unsolvable maze, right? And if that's not grief, if that's not uh, PTSD, if that's not the sheer confusion of being alive right now in 2023, I don't really think we're paying attention to what's happening. One um, recommendation that makes me think of um, my friend and colleague, uh, Elliot Woods, who um, was in the army, but then also reported from Afghanistan, made a podcast this past year called uh, Third Squad, where he reported on a number of Marines he had been embedded with 10 years ago, basically checking in on them 10 years after their deployment. And man, they're all... They're all damaged to some degree by the war. Some have recovered better than others. And it's it's inspiring because those guys are giving each other strength and helping each other with their recovery. Absolutely. Um, And, you know, and they saw terrible things. And, um, yeah, so I'll send you a link to that when we're done. Um, It's it's, it's like, you know, I do so much. A part of my sobriety, too, is, you know, staying involved with, you know, uh, teaching at halfway houses with prison populations. And so, like, Mm. I I deal with with veterans a lot. um, And, like, I just have such a tremendous amount of empathy. Like, for somebody who is willing to do, like, something that is so unprocessable, like, going into battle. And then returning home and having our apathy and ambivalence in their fucking faces every day. Um, it's disgusting. Yeah. Uh, and now all of a sudden we're all emerging from our own Afghan caves, right? That is our kind of our lockdown or our incarceration. And, and I think these are really important conversations, right? But like my job as a novelist, if I start talking about it, it sounds like I'm going to feed you a bunch of fucking vegetables. Right, right. And like, who the hell wants that? It's this, this is not a polemic. Like, it's it's entertaining. It's, it's a story. Fast, it's fast as hell. It's balls crazy. It's certainly abiding by the philosophy of demented whimsy. So, like, yes, we're talking about some really deep and important zeitgeisty things. But if I've done my job right, you have a smile on your face the whole time. So, the other component of the story is that um, 
you know, I, I earned most of my living writing in Hollywood. Uh, and when the writer's strike happened at the beginning of May, I thought to myself, like, what's going to be the thing that's going to make this time away from work the most pleasurable, right? And my daughter was 10 at the time. I was like, I want to make a book with my kid. Yeah. So I asked Ava if she wanted to do some watercolors for the book. Um, and she did this kick-ass job. Like, they really came together and gave that kind of childlike whimsy. So there's a really interesting yin-yang happening because it's not a children's story by any stretch of the imagination. It's a pretty twisted tale. Uh, but to see it through her sort of like 10-year-old Salvador Dali lens was really, really exciting. And just my daddy heart, you know, getting the opportunity to make art uh, with my favorite person was was something that I will not soon forget. You told the story on uh, the Finding Favorites podcast about how you, I don't know, uh, swindled <laughs> the, the the publisher into paying your daughter to do the watercolors. But I mean, she did a terrific job. I mean, to your point, like when I she did the first drawing she did was the lacerated queen losing her head. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and I saw it and I, I kind of took my breath away for a second. But like as a parent, you can't tell how compromised you are. So I sent it to my three meanest friends. I was like, are these good? Is this good, right? Or am I just like a, a dad? <laughs> and they were like, no, no, it's good. And then I sent it to three other mean friends just to make sure. Um, and so then we ended up doing the book. And when I told, the, the publisher sent me, I told him I wanted it to be illustrated. And he sent me a couple references and they were just wrong. Um, so I was like, I know somebody. I know this lady named Ava. Um, all true totally I'm not true. lying <laughs> mm -hmm. and I talked to my friend who used to run uh, Paramount you know and I was like hey when can I tell him the truth and he was like as soon as you sign the fucking deal <laughs> when the ink is dry uh, but you know I mean it, like so you know what you're saying is the publisher saw her work and agreed with you that it was the right work and then and then learned that this was your daughter who had done these these watercolors uh, which well, I, and, I, and there's yeah, there's one for every chapter right the other component of that story that is is I think really important is that in 2023 if you're not doing artistically exactly what you want to be doing you're not paying attention to the world that's going on around you like yeah. write the song you want to see write the play you want to see write the poem you want to hear and so like i far sickness is not going to be for everybody like it'll have its disciples certainly and there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be like i don't even know what this is like what the hell is going on right now and that's totally fine like i want this a story like this to have extreme reactions like i have no problem with one star reviews and i have no problem with five i don't want three Right. Like, I don't want I don't want your apathy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe we're all in a similar place. Like my Fernois at some point in the pandemic, I think it was December 2020. I just like I had a week off and I just got in my CRV and drove to Florida from Chicago Love and like it. rented. And I had never I, this was central Florida, Cocoa Beach, which is kind. I'm a surfer and that's a little bit of a surfing Mecca. But I had never been there. But I was just like, I want a little beach motel with a kitchenette. I want some waves. I want some humidity. Right. I want I want I want to wear short sleeves for a little bit and you know i it just like i got out of the car and the humidity hit me and i smiled and muscles that had been clenched for oh, i don't know six months it. just all like relaxed yeah. and and then the other thing is like this podcast is an example but like in the last year since leaving my job, I have been able to collaborate with my friends and make more creative things than I've been able to do for 20 years. And I think that that was just like a necessity. Yeah, I think it, sure. I think it had to happen. And, you know, this podcast has allowed me to reconnect with my friend Chris and to sort of discover, rediscover a love of reading and books and make new friends. And I mean, the, just the idea that somehow in your life, as you are making your living and advancing your career, you can collaborate with your daughter on something that feels authentic to yeah. your creative yeah. vision. And, and it feels like something you want to say, like that's, 
what else what else is life for <laughs> well and if we're if we're trying to sift through like you know that carcass of the year and a half that we lost like if we're trying to pull some like nutrient rich life lessons to bring with us it's just that like we all are slaking for purpose and so the thing that makes you undeniably happy like if you're not trying to advocate and champion to that to the utmost degree, you're probably not living the most fulfilling life that you can be living, right? So in a sense, yeah. what, what I'm hearing you describe is the same thing that I would talk to my graduate students about, which is like, this is the era of zero fucks art. Like if you're not doing the exact thing that you want to be doing, you should start doing it yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. What was your thought about the idea that, you know, you, the, you, it sounds like you digested a little bit of our discussion around, you know, the, the protagonist who doesn't do much in right. the arrest. What, where did that take you? Well, what's, what I think is interesting about uh, the idea about hapless is, is, is just the notion of like, well, what are you in charge of? Right. Because mm. it's like, you know, an old writing workshop thing would be like, you know, you can't have passive characters like you have to have active characters. And then what we mean by that would be that that person's decision-making mechanism and logic system is driving the story forward. And I've never seen that as a binary. Like I've never right. seen it that you're either an active or you're a passive character. So if, you know, if we're thinking about haplessness being that you're, you know, being gripped by forces that you do not know how to control or you are not able to control, to me, that doesn't necessarily make you passive. It just means that now all of a sudden your thrust, your your petri dish has been shaken so extravagantly that being hapless is forcing you to activate, right? So in, in I'll, I'll, not in terms of the Leithen book, but just to bring it back to Hal in, in Far Sickness for a while, like he's yeah. absolutely an active character. He's driving the decision-making of the story, but is he actually going anywhere? Or is he sitting on his couch? Or is he lying in a bathtub? Or is he wherever is he happened to be? So I think we're at this weird uh, and very cool moment where we can have our cake and eat it too in this kind of passive, active conversation. Uh, and that's why the thing that I really appreciated about the Lethem, because he's so charismatic. Um, Lethem is has such a gift of creating right. charismatic narrators. I mean, just to go back to the, you know, Tourette's detective, right? right. Motherless Brooklyn. From Motherless Brooklyn. I love yeah. Fortress of Solitude. And what he's doing with the kind of this this neo-noir stuff, I mean, he's really, really tearing the the mythos apart in a really captivating and engaging way. Well, you know, and if you think about I don't know if did you read The Arrest, the one that we talked about too? Mm -hmm. I love that book. And in that case, you know, that character, Journeyman, I don't think he makes a single decision that influences the outcome of that book for his community, right? He doesn't save the town. His, spoiler, his sister saves the town <laughs> and her girlfriend saved the town and he watches. And, you know, one of the observations is, though, if you had made them the protagonists, it would be a little bit boring because they didn't really have any trouble you know the 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 threat right. showed up they made a plan and so then in the case of your protagonist uh hal dalloway a wonderfully literary laden name too um it, he is being kind of bossed around by all of absolutely these forces but every now and again they force him to make a decision too right and so you know, early on in the section I read, he has to destroy a version of himself. Yes. Uh, I mean, actually, very early what he has to destroy is, a, is an army of other Hal's, right? So when he finally gets to Dalloway Castle, like he's the only Hal who wants to remember what happened to Dill. And mm. everybody on the other side, the, the castle is being attacked by an army of Hal's that look exactly like Hal's. And they all they all don't want to remember. Right. So that be, he becomes the antagonistic force in his own story. Right. So that's another contortion of being hapless. <laughs> well, and it I mean, it also seems like I mean, I don't know. I don't know where you're I haven't read that much of the book, but it seems like. I, I think it seems like 
what the book seems to be saying to me is that when somebody is damaged or they need to heal or they need to recover, there's some part of them that knows what to do, but they need to listen to that part. And there are other parts of them that are, they have to overcome, that they have to conquer, yeah. that are telling them, no, don't remember, don't think about that because it's going to hurt like hell, right? Yeah, you know, and I think what what I'm maybe I just I'm an, old, I'm an old junkie, right? So maybe I just kind of always think about it in terms of like the the junkie life. There's that old joke, right? Where if a alcoholic steals your wallet, he'll show up the next morning crying and confessing, and if a junkie steals your wallet, he'll show up the next morning and help you look for it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the, the, there's this idea that like us, us junkies have really wormy programmings. Um, and there's the majority of Hal doesn't want to remember what he did to Dill. The the majority of Hal has endured so much in his life that they're, they 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 think and cogently I might add <laughs> they feel as though that if he finally remembers this one thing that that might be the straw that breaks the camel's back and and kills him. Mm. Right. So it's not as though the other Hal's are are the kind of antagonists who are just mustache twirlers. Like the other hows are mechanisms of self-protection. They're just wrong. Right. Right. And like right. a lot of our, our instincts have the potential to be wrong. And at the beginning of the journey, before he follows the call to come home to the place he's never been, Hal is not capable of doing that work. Right. And the trajectory of the plot puts such meaningful pressure on him, both spiritually, existentially even emotionally, um, that he has no choice but to come to grips with what he did to Dill if he's trying to have that ultimate healing. Now, this is the other thing about being sober. Like, being sober doesn't mean your life gets better. <laughs> you know, I know lots of people who think that, and it's just, it just means that they haven't had to get clean. It doesn't right. mean that your life is going to get better. It just means that, like, you're not going to be actively making your life worse in the same way. And... I don't necessarily have this experience, but I would imagine that stopping the intake of whatever the drug or the alcohol is, is only a step towards the easy recovery. Part. Sure. Right. Yeah. right. I mean, any, I think, you know, you can get clean, but then like what happens when three years goes by and you get a bit of bad news. I would make the argument that most junkies and drunks are good at hearing bad news because we've been hearing it most of our lives. It's when I hear good news that fucks me up, right? Because mm. then my little, my little programming starts to go. Oh, don't you deserve a celebration? Mm -hmm. Oh, you finally crossed the finish line, Josh. Shouldn't you have a reward? So it's really interesting how like those viruses continue to try to find the right route uh, to bring you back into their kind of squalid cathedral. <laughs> Snakes trying to penetrate the castle. Yeah, right? like, absolutely. Looking, like mice looking for holes in your armor. Absolutely. Well, anything else you want to say just before I read the credits and uh, take us out? Um, gosh, you know, I think the just to echo back to what I'm hoping is the big takeaway from this conversation, like a couple people buy the book, that's great. But what I'm more hopeful of is that they can kind of think about the conversation that we're having about maybe the parts and the chambers of their artistic heart that might be dormant right now, right, or might be sort of latently existing, like maybe tomorrow is the day, maybe today is the day that you that you shake the cobwebs out and you decide to honor those aspects of your personality because i can't wait to see what you cook up well chris wrote a novel in the past year oh, i wrote cool. two screenplays we haven't really shared them with anybody I happen to note that your editorial business offers a consultation. So maybe after this episode is done, we'll get in touch with you on a professional level to see <laughs> if you are uh, the one. This is something you do, right? Is help people with their writing projects. Yeah. Um, do you want to say a quick word about that business? Yeah, sure. I've been running an editorial business for a long time where I was, you know, when I was transitioning out of full time academia, I was thinking about the aspects of being a, a professor that I really enjoy. And it was always thesis work. 
when somebody can give me an entire beginning, middle, and an ending, and then we get to do an entire revision together. Like being mm. there on the line level at the same time is very exciting. And you know, I call the I call my business to camp because I want to acknowledge that probably what you're going to hand me is pretty good. Uh, but I also know that nobody wants to read your pretty good book, right? Like. I've never said that to anybody in my whole life. I've never said, hey, Jesse, read this book. It's pretty good, right? So I'm going to take something that's pretty good, and then together we're going to make it great. And that's the exciting thing about having an editorial collaboration. I love, I love you. I, I mean, I just love your encouragement to everybody to be creative and to follow. And then, and, but then it's also, I mean, I used to have a boss, an editor who said, follow your heart and get an edit. And he's a very <laughs> different personality than you, but it's the same spirit, right? You know, first you have to find that spark that's o that only you can provide. And then you have to do the hard work of actually figuring out what it needs uh, to make it. And, I, and I think it's also important to put, you know, the phrase hard work in quotation marks, you know, like we're not digging ditches in the sedan right now. Good like, point. We're having this bourgeois pursuit of like making a story. Yeah, <laughs> it can it can feel like it, though. But it you're right. It's a, it's, it, like, uh, it is a privilege to be able, you know, if, if the worst thing in your life is your draft three deadline that you're losing sleep about, that's the sign of a great oh, life. Oh, for sure. And, Absolutely. Well, uh, Upper Middle Brow is a Small Point production. Chris Bag and Jesse Dukes are the creators and producers. The music's by Ben Pajak and Jesse Dukes. Design and website by Chris Bag. Thanks to Joshua Moore for joining us today. We have a listener survey on our website. Fill it out, and if you want, we'll enter you into a drawing to win a storied Bluetooth speaker. That's our fancy way of saying used. Uh, <laughs> perfect for listening to Upper Middle Brow. Uh, you can go to UpperMiddleBrow.com for a link to the survey. And uh, as a reminder, Chris and I are both writers and editors, as is Josh, and can help you with your writing, a podcasting, or editing project. Uh, you can see some of our portfolios and learn more at our respective websites, ChrisBag.com, JesseDukes.com. Josh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. And where would people go if they want to learn more about you and your work? Uh, I've got a website that I update once every 15 years, probably just joshuamore.net. Awesome. Awesome. It was a nice talking shop. Keep fighting the good fight. Yeah. We'll see. Thanks a lot. <laughs>